very, very generous to the Rolling Sun Festival over the years. Port West, The Bookshop, McLaughlin's, Black Shell, Creative Ireland, um, Mayo County Council, and Destination Westport. Now, Geonet Ferreter is one of Ireland's most renowned historians. He's Professor of Modern History at UCD. He's author of many books and a regular broadcaster on TV and radio. He also writes a weekly column for the Irish Times. So I don't think he needs much of an introduction. And so I give you Dermot Ferreter. so much to bring culture and vibrancy and warmth to, to Westport on winter uh, days and they're very special days. It's lovely to be back. It's always nice to be uh, in Westport and I just want to thank you for all the work you put into organising uh, and coordinating. I appreciate the lot goes into it. And thank you all for being here. I'm also well aware that Sundays are very precious and that the few free hours that you have could be spent in a variety of different ways and I really do appreciate uh, that you've given up some of your time to hear what I have to say and to hear me speak about uh, a project that, if I take a long view, uh, has probably been in gestation for over 40 years. Uh, one of my earliest memories is a trip to the Blasket Islands in July 1977. I was barely five and I remember being terrified at the vastness of the sea and the smallness of the boat. <laughs> I also remember being in, intrigued, my childhood mind being intrigued as to what it might have been like to live on that island, the Blasket Island, the Great Blasket, to go to school there, uh, to have um, a, an island life. Um, and I suppose that interest never really went away. Uh, almost 20 years later, I found myself, this time as a professional historian in the National Archives in Dublin. Um, I was researching an exhibition for the 75th anniversary of the state uh, to mark the foundation of the state in 1922. And I was looking for examples of documents that would illustrate some of the challenges facing this newly independent state. Um, and I had said to myself, if Ireland is intriguing as an island off the west of Europe, well then the islands off that island must be even more intriguing if we consider them as Ireland raised to the power of two. Um, and I found a document that related to Tory Island off the coast of Donegal. From 1922, it was a letter written to central government by Father Carr, who was the Catholic priest administering to the islands. And he compiled a very detailed memorandum enclosed with the letter on the plight uh, of the islanders. And he referred to a uh, population that he regarded uh, as almost destitute. There were 350 people on Tory Island at that stage. Uh, he reckoned two-thirds of them were destitute. He commented that they were beautiful speakers of the native Irish language, uh, but that there was no market for kelp. Uh, the soil was poor, and the kids were going hungry to school. And he also observed that the rural district council on the mainland would do nothing for the islanders because they would not pay their rates. Uh, and this proved to be a very enduring theme uh, in relation to the islands and the relationship between the islands uh, and the mainland. But he also posed a question and a challenge at the end of the letter. <coughs> Who in power is bold enough to devise a scheme? Now, that could have been a question asked <coughs> of the islands. It was also, arguably, a question that was being asked about the new state and its prospects. Who in power would be bold enough uh, to devise a scheme? And that certainly is one of the themes that I kept encountering in researching the history of the islands. This notion of responsibility for the islands, for the islanders' welfare, and all that went with that. There were themes in that letter from Father Carr that were central to island living and to the island experience uh, in the 1920s, but also at other times. At later stages, of course, I read many books relating to the islands, including the evacuation of the Blaskets. There was an English journalist, Cole Morton, um, who wrote a lovely book called Hungry for Home. And what he suggested was that the islanders in Kerry had been treated 
with suspicion and hostility uh, by the state. And there is a degree of truth in that in relation to islanders. But of course, the, the history is a lot more complex. If you take the statistics for the number of people populating the offshore islands, you can see that overall it is a story of very stark decline. Between 1841 and 2011, the population of the offshore islands declined from 34,000 to 9,000. There were 211 inhabited islands in 1841, with a population, an offshore population of 34,000 uh, people. Um, and you can assess or see the degree uh, of, of, of stark decline uh, in those broad uh, statistics. The great tragedy, as many saw it, was that these are places that were declining, that were associated with the essence of Irish identity. For many, they were vestiges of an undivided nation. For others, they were wells that could be drawn on uh, in order to recreate Ireland. And these assertions about the potential for the islands were often made at a time when they were crumbling from the inside. Uh, you can see in the 19th century in Mayo, for example, in the Inishki Islands, you can see um, in the late 19th century, uh, 60 whitewashed cabins, uh, a population of roughly 300 people, uh, a relatively healthy economy, an island that had been spared uh, the ravages uh, of the famine, uh, had two schools, uh, and yet by the 1920s and the 1930s it is struggling for survival. So you could argue that they were crumbling from the inside uh, at that stage, and yet they were continually referred to in the context of the essence of Irish independence and indeed Irish defiance. There was a truce between the IRA and British Crown forces uh, in July 1921. And there were then negotiations that ultimately led to the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Um, and during that lull period, uh, a Sinn Féin TD, Alex McCabe, made a contribution to a dull debate in which he suggested in August 1921 uh, that Irish Republicans um, should dig themselves in on the Aran Islands and declare an Irish Republic. And it was interesting that he chose that particular spot uh, as, as representing uh, the most appropriate place for a defiant declaration of Irish independence. And he was none too pleased uh, subsequently with how these negotiations uh, panned out. For some, the islands were, of course, sites of tradition. For others, they were sites of innovation. But you keep coming back to this issue of how the potential could be realised. What was the relationship between the state and the islands? What constituted a proactive uh, island policy? In 1957, Cornelius Lucien, who was the Catholic Bishop of Cork and Ross, wrote a letter to Aidan O'Leary and Taoiseach insisting that the islands deserved to be saved for the nation. And he was concerned, of course, about the islands in his diocese, the islands off the coast uh, of Cork. But he also made reference to the failures of independence. For all of the talk and all of the rhetoric associated with self-sufficiency and with achieving the potential for Irish independence, the experience of the relationship between the state and the islands would suggest uh, that there had been many failures. And that prompts you to go back further to the late 19th century under British rule. The Congested Districts Board, which was established in 1891, regarded as one uh, of the uh, progressive innovations of the British state in Ireland, targeting impoverished communities of the West in order to try and improve their standard of living, to try and improve the housing uh, stock, for example, but also facilitating the buying off of landlords. And this was to be very relevant to the island communities in the late 19th and the early 20th century. Clare Island, uh, for example, was at the centre of this. Uh, at that stage in the early 1890s, there were three years rent owed uh, on Clare Island, 20 of 98 tenants had been evicted from their homesteads uh, on the islands. Uh, but eventually the island, under the auspices uh, of these uh, congested district board initiatives, was sold uh, to the tenants. Uh, and the scale of works between 1895 and 1901 on an island, uh, on, on Clare Island in this case, was extremely impressive. The congested district board also made a difference to the Basket Islands, to the Inishki uh, Islands. Uh, and we have the baseline reports uh, of the Congested District Board inspectors, because they went around to all the islands and compiled very, very detailed memoranda on what the living conditions were and what the state of the fishing industry was, uh, and whether or not the houses needed to be replenished, whether they needed state rules. They're very, very detailed reports. They're a great source uh, for historians. The difficulty, however, with native rule is that the Congested District Board was wound down and it was not replaced. 
And that was to be of huge consequence in relation to the islands. In 1925, Sean McGrath, who was a, an official in the Land Commission, wrote about Ackle Island and suggested, this is in 1925, that as much has been done for Ackle Island as can be done. The real problem is the spirit of depravity that pervades the islands. <laughs> they are always looking outside the resources of the island in order to have their problems solved. Now you'd appreciate there is a harshness to this private correspondence and these private memoranda in relation to the characters of the islands. It also seems to be an assertion uh, that this new state is not going to be proactive. Um, and the Congested Districts Board was uh, wound up, and there was then no body with a definite policy uh, for the islands. All the work that they had done in relation to the harbours, uh, for example, uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, and you could fairly reach a conclusion that was more was done for the island communities under British rule uh, than was done under native rule, um, if you look at it in a particular way. Uh, this issue of, of rates also remained, remained um, uh, very contested. Um, there were individuals who gave evidence to the Commission on the Belfort uh, in the middle of the 1920s who spoke about the tensions in the relationship between uh, the islands and the local authorities in relation to the paying of rents. But Father Duggan, who administered, administered to the islanders on Arran Moor, the Donegal uh, Arran Moor, uh, which is a heavily populated island, also referred to the idea that Scotland and the United States were better to the islanders than was Ireland, because of the tradition there, of course, of, of, of seasonal uh, migration. And there were huge challenges for the fishing industry um, in the middle of the 1920s, which were not the fault uh, of the Irish state. They were the fault of the mackerel who decided to leave Irish waters. Uh, and that had a huge consequence. Um, there were 65,000 people working in fishing in Ireland in 1829. A century later, in 1929, it's estimated there were only 1,000 full-time fishermen uh, in Ireland. So it really was uh, a remarkable uh, transformation uh, in the fortunes of fishing. And of course, mackerel had returned to US waters, uh, so we couldn't necessarily blame the state uh, for that. But you can blame the state for the fact that the uh, estimate for the Department of Fisheries in 1925 was just £25,000. So it didn't seem to be a, a particular priority. The islands, however, often came in to uh, national consciousness and became national and sometimes international news uh, as a result of the fate of some of those fishermen. The Cleggan disaster in particular in 1927 when 44 lives were, were lost. Uh, and you had uh, fishermen from Inish Lachan, from the Inish Gies, from Arran, uh, from Inish Boffin. An extraordinary tragedy. Um, and, and all the dependents, of course, that were left behind. And a pattern was established in relation to responding to these sea tragedies. There was fundraising and very uh, generous contributions from all over the country and outside of the country. There were also demands that there be better warning, weather warnings, uh, for those engaged in fishing, uh, which was becoming such a dangerous pursuit. There was also some reference to the pitiful hovels in which the islanders were deemed to be living. Uh, but W.T. Cosgrave, head of government at that time, preferred instead to talk about the extent to which they were God-fearing, thrifty and hard-working. Uh, and we do get that piety and those pious assertions in relation to the character uh, of the islands and these tragedies uh, happen. But the state did not contribute directly to the fund that was raised to try and ease the lot of the islanders. And to break it down, 11 breadwinners from the Inish Gee Islands were lost on that single night um, in, in 1944. Um, and the Inish Gees were evacuated then in 1934 at a cost to the state of £13,000. That island was not, those islands were not sustainable after the loss in a single night of 11 breadwinners, and you'll appreciate why. There was to be another tragedy that generated national and international headlines in 1935, again off Aaron Moore uh, in Donegal, uh, when there were 19 uh, fishermen who drowned. There was one survivor, Patrick Gallagher, who left his account of what it was like to cling on to his brother and his father as they slowly slipped into their icy graves. And he could see the lights on the island being extinguished one by one by one. And nobody could hear the anguished screams, which of course became more and more faint. But Patrick Gallagher did survive. He was then uh, expected to live on a disability pension of 15 shillings uh, a week.
Padre O'Donnell was furious, and Padre O'Donnell, uh, a socialist Republican activist and uh, a talented writer whose first teaching job had been uh, on Inish Free, one of the Donegal Islands, he was furious in the aftermath uh, of the Iron War tragedy, and he insisted that the impounding of the gale and the trek to the Scottish Tatty Field had to be brought to an end, but that the poor of the islands needed to be startled also into a sense of their own stature. There was a lot of debate in the aftermath of that tragedy about the need for better beacons uh, when it came to sea travelling uh, around the islands. Uh, but another issue was, who was responsible for the erecting of beacons? Who was responsible? Uh, who, which government department uh, would take on this uh, as an area of responsibility? Was it going to be the Minister for Lands, the Minister for Industry and Commerce, the Minister for Local Government and Public Health? the uh, junior minister in fisheries? Was it going to be the Office of Public Works? This is the problem. Responsibility for the islands was spread far too thinly. And you can see that when they're struggling desperately to respond to some of these dreadful tragedies. But as always happened, the Department of Finance ultimately held sway. Because whatever recommendations were being made, acting on them was going to involve, of course, raising money. And the Department of Finance was somewhat sceptical uh, about the idea that the smaller islands uh, needed to be invested in, given the small population. Certainly in 1936, uh, the Iron Islands um, got a state-backed, state-supported, state-subsidised steamer because of the size of the population uh, on, on uh, Aran, um, and on the biggest of the Iron Islands. But those privileges were not going to be extended to the smaller islands. And what was discovered at central government level due to correspondence from local government was again this issue of the islanders not paying their rates. And this wasn't just true of the Free State, it was also true uh, of the new state of Northern Ireland. Rathlin Island was the only populated island uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and what was interesting about Rathlin is that uh, there was often cross-party support uh, for the islanders of Rathlin, which is a very unusual thing to generate cross-party support about anything uh, in Northern Ireland, but the Rathlin Islanders managed uh, that even at a later stage. Both John Hume and Ian Paisley could agree uh, that the Rathlin Islanders needed to be uh, supported. There's roughly 100 people there uh, to this day. But they weren't paying their rents either in the 19, or their rates in the 1920s. And in 1926, Harold Barber, who was chairman of Ant Antrim County Council, and of course they had responsibility uh, for Rathlin Island, uh, he noted in a letter to the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, James Craig, that HMS Hood was in the vicinity of Northern Waters. This was staffed by 1,500 people. It was a 45,000 tonne uh, battleship. It was the largest uh, in the British Navy. Um, and what he suggested, Harold Barber, was that this battleship should be sent out to Rathlin Island to give them a scare in order to ensure that they would pay their rates. <laughs> Now, James Craig was aghast at this suggestion as Prime Minister, and he wrote a note on the letter saying, out of the question. <laughs> Harold Barber's wife subsequently ran, ran uh, James Craig to suggest that he had been joking. Uh, Harold Barber had been joking about this suggestion, but I'm not too sure uh, when you look uh, at the text of the letter that he sent um, at that time. There was also discussion on islands like Inish Murray off the coast of Sligo, which was evacuated in 1948, about how best money should be spent should be spent if the state was prepared to provide funding. Uh, he made the point when the island was evacuated, um, Michael Waters, who was king of Inishbury Island, made the point that it cost 10,000 to rehouse the Inishbury Islanders on the mainland. Had that money been spent on a harbour, he suggested, it could have sustained the population on the island. There were also those who came up with their own ways of fundraising, including one William Rogers, who went under a number of different names. He was on Tory Island, and he was great for sending out distress letters uh, to various groups in order to try um, and solicit charitable donations. Um, he also managed to get money from the Southern Loyalist uh, Association for the plight of the Tory Islanders by insisting uh, that they were all loyal uh, to king and country. Uh, which was very far from the truth. Any of you who know uh, Tory Island will know there was not much sympathy there uh, when it came to loyalism. Uh, but needs must, uh, perhaps. Now, in terms of the politics of this, and the plight of the islands and the response of politicians, Devon Era did go on an island tour in 1947. Um, this was regarded by many as being far too late in the day, 
Um, there were suggestions uh, that he was indulging himself. The Kerryman newspaper thundered in an editorial to coincide with the visit. The island's disease is purely economic. The functions of the old congested districts board have not since been charged, uh, have not since been discharged efficiently. And he was talking about since uh, it was bound down in the middle of the 1920s. And of course, the Blaskus was then evacuated uh, in 1953. And George Thompson, um, the classicist who spent time on the Blasket Islands, suggested that a social system that let such a culture die must be rotten in some way. Now, the Blasket Island evacuation was, of course, precipitated by uh, the death of Sean Carney on the island. Uh, and his brother, Mike, who was working as a barman in Dublin, who of course had to return as a result of uh, this tragedy. He also wrote a letter to de Valera um, around this time in the late 1940s, suggesting that given government policy in relation to the Gwaltacht and the Irish-speaking areas, given the beauty of the Irish of the Blasket Islanders, why was the island being allowed to die? But as the Department of the Taoiseach saw it, it wasn't as straightforward as that. A private memorandum in 1947 had suggested that the island is dying out and perhaps it is better for them that it does so. It would, however, be a good place for a holiday for anyone who is satisfied with simple pleasures. I did not suggest, of course, that there was going uh, to be much uh, state engagement with the idea of a future uh, for the Blasket Islands. Jack McQuillan, who was the Clan of the Public the, uh, TD, uh, a couple of years later suggested that the Doyle looked on the inhabitants of the Aran Islands as inhabit inhabitants of a leper's colony. Uh, such was the fulmination about what was regarded uh, as the neglect or the failure to respond to basic requests uh, for the islanders. Before de Valera's trip in 1947, there was also a letter written by Pat Gibbons from Mayo County Council uh, to the county manager in Castle Bar. And he suggested in relation to Clare Island and Inish Turk that there were three pressing needs, three imperatives that needed to be highlighted. The first was access to a doctor. The dependency on the dispensary doctor in Lewisburg was not working. You also then had a demand for proper harbour facilities and finally for flour. And of course those basic needs uh, of, of food uh, often came uh, to the surface in relation to these island demands. But the Islanders did, of course, like so many of the others, welcome de Valera in 1947. They were glad to have such a senior, distinguished and prestigious visitor uh, coming to the islands, because it did suggest that there was some level of awareness uh, about their existence. Um, and they also suggested on Clare Island in their address to de Valera that uh, it was a great advance, the presence of the Taoiseach was a great advance on the time when gunboats had been sent out uh, under British rule to collect rent. And that certainly survived uh, in the memory, in the folk memory, uh, of a lot of the uh, islanders. But you can see, even as you trace that state island theme up through the 1960s and the 1970s, there is a preference within the Department of Finance for what's termed in 1975 a natural drift to the mainland. Just allow it to happen. Uh, they use the phrase a natural drift. Uh, of course, islanders would have taken issue uh, with that description of what was happening. George Colley, as Minister for Finance in 1978, did not accept in his own words, without qualification, that the islanders were as entitled to the same services uh, as the mainlanders. Uh, W.T. Cosgrave, uh, or Liam Cosgrave, I should say, his son, was asked in 1975 uh, if he would agree to the creation of an island authority, uh, and he refused that. And that remained a problem. There was still no central development committee uh, for the island people. There was no Irish equivalent, for example, to the Highland and Islands Board in Scotland, which catered for a population of roughly 353,000. It's not until the late 1990s that the islands actually find their way into a government department title, uh, which was around the time I was researching the 75th uh, anniversary of the state. And Eamon O'Quive, who became the minister with responsibility for the islands, <coughs> insisted that they do not want to become a protected species. This did not have to be about a salvage operation. This should be about uh, modernity. It should be about creativity uh, and innovation. And certainly some uh, sought uh, to try and build that innovation and creativity and look at the possibilities for islands in relation to membership of the European Economic Community and, and what became uh, the EU. And there were others outside of politics who were very engaged with uh, island issues.